welcome to our new webinar series. Uh, we are, I'm Lisa Anderson, president of ASCM or Apex Inland Empire Chapter, and uh, also president of LMA Consulting Group. And I'm thrilled to be kicking off our uh, new webinar series with John Tulak. John Tulak is, has spoken for us before, and he is like timely to be sure. So John is an international and general business and corporate attorney. He's recognized in the Bar Register of Preeminent Attorneys as an expert in the field of international business law and is annually listed as a leading lawyer in the Los Angeles County and Inland Empire. In essence, he is very active in all areas relating to import and export. He also happens to be a uh, expert in China and, and, well, all throughout the world, but uh, he has trained judges from uh, China and he's also... Um, an expert in Mexico and the Middle East, because he, if that wasn't enough, John also actually has an expertise in uh, energy and oil and natural gas. So a wealth of knowledge and with everything going on in the world today, there couldn't be a more important topic. So I'm excited to uh, hear what John has to say and to have some interactive discussion. So John, with that said, I will turn it over to you because I think you have um, a few slides you'd like to start with. Hi, thank you, Elisa, and I'll pull those slides up on share screen in, in just a moment. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm very happy to be here with you today to, to talk about the world as I see it. I draw upon a multitude of resources, some of which are highly confidential, some of which you have as much access to as I do, such as the Wall Street Journal and The Economist, The New York Times, uh, and, and so on. But it's making sense of all of this stuff that is part of my job in terms of helping my clients evaluate uh, and, and understand uh, political and economic risks as they do business around the world. So uh, today I'll be sharing with you really a, an emphasis on the hot spots in the world, and we have quite a few of them, and, and some of the implications of, of those things, not only in terms of our country and uh, our power or sometimes lack thereof with respect to some of these conflict areas, but also in terms of what it means for U.S. businesses, particularly with respect to uh, impacts on supply chains. So that's going to be the focus today. And I'm going to start with something that I hadn't thought about in a long time, but it's actually appropriate. In my first year of practice, uh, I happened to be driving up uh, five, stopped in Sacramento in a Chinese restaurant that actually had really good food. And I got the world's best fortune cookie uh, because inside the fortune cookie was the following. It said, society defines the crime and the criminal commits it. And I'm thinking, what a profound fortune cookie. Society defines the crime, but it's the criminal that commits it. So it's not criminal until we define it. And so that's really what we're looking at today. We're looking at multiple threats to a global order, a world order that's been in place largely since the uh, Marshall Plan and the, the Cannon uh, Memo in, in the late 40s. We, we've had a Pax Americana that is called Pax Americana because the United States primarily enforced a peace of a, of a kind. We didn't have a, a follow-up to World War II as a global war, but we never lacked for conflicts around the world, including conflicts that we participated directly in. But largely the peace is held. And today it looks like Peace is fraying at the edges, at least, uh, in many, many places around the world. And we have a traditional full blown out war that directly challenges what we've constituted as the world order. Uh, and that's the war in, between Ukraine and, and Russia. So what we're looking at here is a lot of separate conflicts, but when we see this as a whole, there are potentially grave, grave implications for what we have known and understood as the world order. So that's going to be my focus today. I'm going to go up to the uh, share screen and try and find my slides. 
and all sounds the... good and it sounds like a very uh relevant topic john so <laughs> and where did they go and it certainly is impacting our um well while you look for them john basically the 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 reason that we've named our new webinar series uh global dynamics is for just this reason navigating supply chain shifts are going to be uh what's utmost on all of our minds for the foreseeable future in order to be uh, successful. All right, John, I see that you have found your slides. Go ahead. There we go. World in 2024, things that go boom in the night <laughs> yeah. and day two. So the, the basic idea, which is very similar to what I did last year, the world's a mess and, and there's nothing new. The world is always a mess in some way, shape or form. If you go back 30 years, 40 years and pick up any newspaper, the New York Times, the LA Times, the Washington Post, and look at the headlines, you'd think the world's going to hell in a handbasket back then. So we're used to bad news. We process a lot of bad news every day. And yet somehow here we are still today. The difference today is in some ways very good. We, we don't have that same fear of nuclear annihilation that we did, let's say, in 1962 during the Cuban Missile Crisis. But we are probably closer to a nuclear conflict today than we have been at any time since 1962, but that doesn't get headlines. So context gives meaning. We always have to put all this bad news that we get in the greater context. And that's part of what I'm trying to do today with this presentation is we're gonna look at a lot of hotspots and it all looks hopeless, but we we somehow find a way of muddling through things. And you know, we can take some comfort from what Winston Churchill said about the United States. He said, the Americans will always do what's right after we've exhausted every other possibility. You know, somehow or other, we manage to muddle through, somehow we manage to get to where we need to be, uh, but sometimes it's a real challenge. So, we have hotspots all over the world. And this is from the uh, uh, Council of Foreign Relations conflict tracker map, which is a really fun tool to use. But you can see right that's now, interesting. PR, we, we have conflict inside Mexico that's primarily gang related. Uh, we see a lot of hotspots scattered throughout the world, some of which we clearly know about the war in Ukraine. Uh, the nutcase in North Korea. What's interesting that's missing is there's no dot on China, but, but China is one of the biggest problems that we have today, not so much in terms of our military conflict, but in, in terms of economic conflict and the, uh, the, the search, if you will, for, for China's place in the world. China wants to be a recognized power. But it's not entirely clear that China wants to be a global power as opposed to a regional power. The projection of Chinese power today is almost exclusively in its own backyard. That's the South China Sea, the assertion of territoriality over uh, uh, Taiwan, and, and picking fights with literally all of its neighbors. Uh, all of the neighbors in the South China Sea, that's our lake, and you have to do what we, we tell you. Uh, with India, in terms of uh, some border disputes, the border itself doesn't really matter so much uh, geographically uh, as a line. It matters very much in terms of where you define it in terms of control of water supply. Uh, and both India and China face massive shortages of water. As Mark Twain put it, whiskey is for drinking and water's for fighting. Uh, and and you know, without water, we die. And, and you've got the two most populous countries on the planet competing for the scarcest resource in, in the area, and, and that's water. I worry about that sometimes more than anything else uh, when I look at that part of the world. So let's hone in on, on a couple of things, a little bit more detail. The uh, uh, well, let me go back one first. Let's just call it as it is. The war between Ukraine and Russia is a stalemate. 
And Ukraine can win by not losing. Russia has to win. And that's why this conflict remains dangerous. Uh, in my view, the counteroffensive that Ukraine launched in 2023 was a horrible mistake with a foreseeable outcome. You, you wasted your resources that you could use for defense in a futile attempt to try and gain some amount of territory in the disputed Donbas region. And up to a third of, of the uh, armor uh, Ukraine lost in this current campaign with virtually no gains. And, and to me, that was a waste of resources. Uh, hold on a second, let me get rid of that call. We can expect more of the same in 2024, uh, except that I don't think you'll see another attempt at uh, an offensive on Ukraine's part. For one thing, it's being starved uh, in, in terms of military aid. Uh, our aid package is held up because of politics. The EU package, 50 billion did pass. That's not enough uh, by itself, uh, but it's probably enough to help Ukraine hold in place. And that's probably all it can expect. And no one wants to tell the Ukrainians that they're ultimately going to have to negotiate uh, on a ceasefire, some kind of, of deal with the Russians. Nobody wants to tell them that. But, but that's the only outcome that's going to ultimately allow them to keep the bulk of their country intact. Uh, short of the EU and the United States committing the kinds of, of dollars and the kinds of, of uh, war munitions and uh, uh, equipment, Ukraine can't win. It simply can't win. And I don't think whether you see Joe Biden reelected or Donald Trump return to office that either one of them would commit the resources for a Ukrainian win. So it's sad. It's a definite uh, blow to the world order that uh, ultimately some gain in territory will, will get recognized. But that's the real politic of it. I don't see a, a way out of that. The rest of the world would certainly benefit from a ceasefire. Uh, we're still dealing with the ripple effects on, on multiple supply chains for a variety of things, ranging from neon to wheat, uh, disrupted in, in some way, shape, or form by this war and the continuity of this war. If there is any benefit from this war, and I, I hate to say that any war brings about a benefit. We have learned a couple of things from this conflict. Uh, one is a lot of what we took for granted in terms of military uh, strategy has, has proven to be wrong. And, and that's a good thing because those strategies were based on very expensive offensive weapons that lose when you have very effective, inexpensive defensive weapons that can take them out of the picture. We've learned that drones can be used very effectively on both offense and defense, but defensive drones are cheaper uh, and, and easier to deploy uh, and, and can stop a whole lot of stuff. And we actually should have learned this lesson from the Falklands War, where the British fought uh, over the Falklands with Argentina and, and lost a, a major ship uh, to a $200,000 missile. Uh, that's the power of a cheap defensive weapon. So there are takeaways from the Ukraine that you know, should be studied and we should implement. We have a thing called the projection of power, power projection. And historically, it's been defined as the ability to project military power into a region. And of course, the United States has been foremost at being able to do that since the Second World War. But that definition, in my view, is inadequate. It's inadequate to, to a modern world. We are not a world based on uh, being able to control events by a Navy. That, that was Pax Britannica. Pax Britannica held for a couple hundred years because there was no Navy in the world that could stand up to, to the British fleets and the British strategies. And, and 
the British essentially kept the peace for a long period of time, or for long periods of time. <laughs> there were some interruptions. But today, we should be looking at our projection of power, not just in terms of military capacity to send a task force somewhere or to have troops inside of a, uh, uh, a military base in some other country, but we should look at our ability to project power economically, diplomatically, uh, technologically. And uh, uh, these are, are areas that the United States has a great deal of power. But we also have to be able to use those things wisely. And we haven't particularly for, for a long time in, in a lot of these areas. Uh, cyber warfare is a perfect example of, of where we're deficient. We, we know where vulnerabilities are. We have people who work around the clock to identify what those are and, and to build up ways of protecting. Yet we know that our grid system, for example, is, is totally open to attack. It would cost a relatively small amount of money to fortify our grid system against attack, and we don't spend it. To me, that's brain dead stupid. Yeah, it, really. Well, and I heard, John, that there's like, I can't remember the number now, but it was like either a hundred or multiple hundreds of people in China working on like cyber attacks versus R1. Yes, we are attacked daily by hackers who are paid by the Chinese government uh, to, to test out uh, different ways of getting into facilities, both public and private, and they get through. Most of the time they do no damage. It's just to demonstrate capability. But the Russians do the same thing and the Iranians do the same thing. Uh, and, and we have to be constantly vigilant. We are most vulnerable to something that, that takes down one or more systems that we rely on. We rely on everything today to work based on electronics. And, and, and you know, old folks like me, you know, come the zombie apocalypse, we have marketable skills that we learned when we were kids that nobody does anymore. <laughs> <laughs> like know how to read it and follow a paper map kind of thing. Uh, you would have total chaos if our, our banking system, which is now almost entirely electronic, was offline for, for even a couple of days. And, and so these are the kinds of, of threats and, and assessments that we have to do of threats that you know don't get a lot of headlines. But you know, the focus today is primarily on where the conflicts are. Uh, the thing that we just need to recognize is that those conflicts can be brought into our own backyard at any time through electronic means. So that is very worrisome. So let's uh, let's focus a little more closely at a couple of regions. Here you see uh, a lot of red dots, and that means that this is a uh, area of the world that we don't see a lot of headlines about, but this is this is you're getting into sub-Sahara Africa. You have civil war in Sudan. You have conflict in South Sudan. Ethiopia could become a failed state. Eritrea, arguably in a lot of ways, is uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, one of the most misnamed countries on earth, uh, is. Uh, a hotbed of, of uh, disorder and, and, and armed conflict in parts of the country. Uh, we have forgotten about Libya after Gaddafi, but uh, you have civil war in, in all practical purposes, just on a fairly low scale in, in Libya. Those things don't get a lot of headlines, uh, but these are hotspot regions uh, for a variety of reasons. They just don't have a lot of impact on the United States, and so we don't pay attention. Ambrose Bierce, uh, in the Devil's Dictionary, wants to find war as God's way of teaching Americans about geography. That, that unless there's a war and it involves us, we we don't even think these countries exist, and, and that's a failure of our education system. What we do know exists is the Middle East. So you got to keep your eye on this. Uh, area, and the only one that we're really 
seeing a lot of attention being paid to now is, is Yemen uh, and to a lesser extent uh, 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 off uh, the east coast of Africa where you have uh, your, your pirates also staging into the Arabian Sea. So that's all I'm going to say about that. Uh, the last thing about Yemen is, of course, the Houthis are uh, proxies of Iran. And, and uh, uh, of course, Iran says, well, we don't control them. But of course, they they provide all of the arms and, and, and all of the aid. So, well, and, and John, I'm assuming like, and you might be, I might be stealing your thunder, but obviously if you look at this map, the Red Sea, the, uh, the Suez Canal and, you know, is, is all right there. It's all right there. And you have a, a tremendous amount of commerce that, that comes in these areas uh, in both directions. But, but of course the oil is flowing mostly this way and, and that way out of the Persian Gulf and, and, uh, into the Arabian Sea. So you also have in the UAE uh, the hub for the Mideast and staging into even India and Afghanistan and Pakistan, goods that come from all over the world. So one of the reasons why the UAE has that hub position is that it's essentially a free trade zone for, for goods that can be in transit from uh, elsewhere in the world to various places in the Mideast. Uh, it also is neutral on its face. The UAE claims that uh, it doesn't take sides. And if you, you go to Dubai, you will hear uh, folks there very freely criticize everybody in the world, starting with us. Uh, but they, they also uh, call out the Russians, even though they're happy to continue to do business with them. They don't like the Chinese at all, but they do business with them. Uh, it, it's a melting pot for, for commerce in, in that everybody in the world you know, goes to the uh, UAE uh, in some way, shape, or form to, to do business. But uh, uh, it's, it's amoral, if you will. It's uh, a place where literally anybody and everybody, and unfortunately, including the the terrorists and and uh, you know who we otherwise describe as bad guys, can can freely do business. And, and you know that it, it's a, it's a strange place. So you'll see on this map all these spots that have been identified. I put my own X marks to spot. Because Iran is why you have so many of these other hot spots. Iran causes trouble in Iraq. Iran causes trouble in Syria. Iran funds Hamas and Hezbollah. Uh, Iran is dedicated to the utter, complete destruction of Israel, and, and that guides its entire foreign policy in the region. And I do say entire because that that's their their number one stated goal. Their unstated goal is to be the dominant force in this entire region, which means that they will exert their influence on the Arab world, all over in here, uh, and also on the uh, Pakistani, Afghani, and, and, and Indian world over here. That's the kind of power that Iran seeks to have and, and attempts to project. And, and Right now, it's being very, very aggressive. The only thing the Iranians understand, this is the only thing that the Russians understand, the only thing that the North Koreans understand, uh, and the only thing really when you get down to it that the Chinese respect, because they understand a lot of other stuff, is power and the willingness to use it. It is no good whatsoever to have power and to be ineffective in its use. If you are not willing to use the power to accomplish your objectives, then you are perceived by the Russians, Iranians, North Koreans, and, and the Chinese of the world as weak. Every single one of those countries' leaders perceives the United States as weak because we have not uh, projected well our willingness to use power. Uh, probably the, the most appalling failure 
was drawing a line in the sand, which Obama did, uh, and then didn't follow through on it. Total loss of credibility. Uh, we have not had a strong foreign policy for a lot of years. And that goes back to the, uh, the George W. Bush administration that might have been entirely different had it not been for 9-11. But 9-11 totally transformed how we thought about a lot of things. And, and we didn't handle the, the aftermath in the long term very well. Uh, the Obama administration, the Trump administration, and the Biden administration have multiple failures of foreign policy, particularly with respect to the projection of American power and influence. Uh, a, there's, there's plenty of blame to go around in that regard. And, and I don't see that improving in 2024, do you? You know, here's the thing. The world is not in good hands. We are still dealing with what uh, uh, Bush called the axis of evil, uh, what uh, Iran calls the axis of resistance. A and we, we have these malign interests opposed to anything that the United States seeks to maintain regarding a, a global world order based on Western values. A and we're not doing much about that that's effective. It's, it's not that we aren't trying things. It's that we have not been effective in, in our use of, of power in all the different ways that I've described, military and, and economically and diplomatically and, and technologically. And so when there's a perception of weakness, a bad party will push the envelope, will continue okay. to take action uh, uh, until it's stopped. A and when you finally say, I'm going to stop this, you risk escalation. Escalation, as Theodore Draper wrote in Norma Vietnam's a long time ago, escalation's inherent in waging limited war. Our goal is not to fight wars and, and certainly not to be involved in, in, in conflicts and conflict management, but the right, use of, of, of intervention all around the world. We simply don't have the means, let alone the will to do that today. But if we do not project power in a meaningful way, then we will continue to be pushed in various parts around the world to our detriment and to the detriment of those who are, are in the way. Uh, this is classic bullying conduct by several countries. And there's only one way that you can deal effectively with a bully, and that's to stand up. You have to stand up to a bully. Uh, we have to stand up to the Russians. We have to stand up to the Chinese. We have to stand up to the Iranians. We have to stand up to North Korea. And, and uh, it is not something that we can do by ourselves. You know, that's why we have allies. And, and yet we have definitely done a very poor job of managing our relationships with our key allies in, in recent years. And, and again, some of that goes back uh, several administrations. But uh, in the last two administrations, it's fair to say that our European allies don't know, understand what we're doing, don't trust our, our leaders, and are wary. Of, of making commitments as, as a result of that. Of course, the, our European friends have always worried about Americans and, and our approach to foreign policy. You know, they're still living with a Europe based on you know, what happened after Waterloo and, and what Mitterrand was able to accomplish in creating a European order. Europeans think American idea of long-term foreign policy is about three weeks because we keep flip-flopping on stuff so much. So th there's a lot to deal with there, and we need to be doing a lot better job of handling that. So here are our supply point chains. It, this shouldn't come as a surprise to any of you who are involved in, in supply chain management. Uh, the Suez Canal Red Sea and the Arabian Sea Persian Gulf are, are the two that are really in, in the hot zones right now. And we're seeing the impact already. We're seeing 
uh, container prices rise. We're seeing shipping diverted uh, away from the area. We're seeing uh, crude oil and refined products shipping around uh, South Africa instead of transiting through uh, the Red Sea and the Suez Canal. All of this costs money. I would expect that this will continue for the foreseeable future in 2024. We will also see insurance rates go up. Uh, we will also see, uh, to the extent that it's possible, the uh, ability to find other trading partners in different parts of the world where we don't have the same political or war risks affecting the, the transit of our goods from, from one place to the other. Uh, of course, one of the biggest problem areas remains the South China Sea, which is international waters, according to everybody else in the world, except China. China has been increasingly aggressive with its neighbors in, in claiming that uh, only it decides who can come through the South China Sea and on what terms. Uh, shooting water cannons and, and, at, at uh, Philippines vessels and, and other ways of, of interfering. And of course, we do get the news that uh, the belligerence shown toward Taiwan has been at its highest level in, in uh, a long, long time. If you're old enough, you remember that uh, communist China under Mao used to shell outlying islands, Kimoy and Matsu, as a way of intimidating what was still called Formosa in those days. And that was the best that they could do in those days. Uh, today, they can overflight, they can, they, they can send military planes and, and, and ships and even in, in, incur into uh, Taiwan territorial waters with impunity. Taiwan is, is not going to push back against that. The United States will sail portions of uh, fleets through the South China Sea as a demonstration that they are international waters and you know, risk an incident. Uh, and it takes only one mistake. You know, one plane flying too close to, to somebody else's plane, one military vessel, the naval vessel that doesn't pull off at the absolute last minute and there's a collision. It just takes one mistake to to then seriously escalate uh, the the risk of, of a a shooting retaliation. So that's going on literally on a daily basis in the South China Sea. Uh, Taiwan elected a new president, very much committed to the independence of uh, of Taiwan. That was to the the great chagrin of uh, China, and, and you will see that there will be various ways of retaliating for, for that act of political courage. And, and, and we don't know what forms that, <clears throat> but, but it's there. But uh, John, um, on the, uh, so the South China Sea, basically, it sounds like is preventing, well, it means that it's precarious to, to go through there for like if 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 folks wanted to move production from like China to I don't know Vietnam or the Philippines or something, the problem is getting it through the South China Sea to to where it needs to go. Correct. Correct, because a lot of goods will not necessarily coming to the United States from uh, neighboring countries to China, but a lot of those goods are going to go to South Korea and Japan, and transiting through the South China Sea is is the direct route. So it. it's not just the impact on the neighbors, uh, not just on our friends there and, and the potential impact on what may come to the United States. It, it's also to our allies. Uh, right. and, and both Japan and, and South Korea have been pretty staunch allies yeah. uh, over the years. So, And the other thing, John, is the, uh, the Suez Canal and the Red Sea. I know, you know, it's certainly been in the news and like it affects uh, just to just to like talk to the details, it affects the uh, ships going from or the container ships going from um, I don't know, you know, the Asia region to Europe, but it also affects um, uh, container ships coming to the east coast of the U.S. Um, what about the Arabian Sea and Persian Gulf? Like, what what do you know? What typically is 
Like what would be impacted with that? So again, you've got goods going in both directions, for example, in and out of Iraq. Like to Europe or where are they going generally? Oh yeah, you, you have cargoes going to Europe, you have cargoes going to Malaysia, Singapore, India. Okay. Yeah. Uh, oh, India too, huh? Okay. Yeah. There, there's a fair amount of commerce there that uh, uh, can can be impacted. Now, you know, that pales in comparison to, you know, some, some other places, particularly again, to the UAE and, and Saudi Arabia. But yeah. still, there's a fair amount of commerce there. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it causes a problem to your point of having many hotspots. So we'll, we'll keep going. But I just wanted to like make sure I clarified that, that if that was correct. So thank you. Sure thing. So Panama Canal, we, we know, is uh, another problem area today, not because of conflict, but because of lack of water. So the, the water levels are way down, and, and, and some vessels cannot make the, the, the transit. And the total number of vessels is is being restricted uh, simply because the the water levels are so low. So that again adds uh, an element of cost. If you can't transit through the Panama Canal, you you get to go around South America and, and uh, you know take the scenic route. And <laughs> we don't know we don't know when Mother Nature will decide that. Uh, more rain for Panama and and, and make the canal right. full again. Right. Well, and that's a real problem, right? Because you can take the scenic route or maybe you could like um, take a truck or something, I don't know, across Panama, perhaps. Yeah. Um, you, you, or like for the US, if you're instead of going that way and then you have the Suez Canal problem as well, like then you might start coming to the um, Los Angeles and Long Beach ports and just uh, railing across the across the country, right? Right. So so rail is, is an option in, until it isn't anymore. We're running a lot of, it's true. of our cars at, at capacity. Uh, our, our ports in the West Coast cannot handle any more coal, cannot handle any more oil and gas. Uh, you know, so it, it all depends on what it is. That That's another good, really good point. Yeah, we, we are maxed out on... Uh, on that kind of stuff, you know, we're we're currently, you know, down from from peak levels in terms of containers into our our southern uh, California ports. So we can certainly see more uh, of those come in. But again, you you have only so much capacity for the rails to take it out. Uh, right. And we also have a shortage of truck drivers. So that we do for sure. <laughs> so we can bring it into the country. <laughs> <laughs> but but then it, it may sit a while before it, it gets moved. It, yeah. it, it, every day it sits is a, is a cost. So uh, it's, it's something that I think will probably likely get worse before it gets better. One more thing about the, the Panama Canal and, and the weather, uh, the, the uh, reversal of, of policy in Brazil uh, with respect to deforesting the the amazon is a refreshing development there there is zero 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 good reason for uh clearing the forests in, in the amazon uh that is economically stupid it's slash and burn agriculture the the soil is so thin that it is only useful for a few years to plant crops before it's played out a, a rainforest soil doesn't just become savanna type soil because you clear the, the timber out and you plant crops. And according to some, we're reaching a, a tipping point at which point the Amazon cannot recover. And the Amazon is like the lungs of the world. Uh, it generates more in terms of our weather globally by its health, its environmental health, than, than any other ecosystem on the planet. And we are dangerously close to screwing it up. Uh, so the the uh, the change in policy that has drastically now curtailed uh, deforesting practices is certainly welcome. The problem is that it continues illegally, and, and Brazil's ability to police it on its own is limited, uh, which is what you would think something like the United Nations would be for a collective effort to. Uh, to put resources into 
keeping healthy one of the most important systems on our planet. But there's no sign of that either. Black Sea you know, goes back to the war uh, between Ukraine and, and Russia. Black Sea is a, a transit area for, for a lot of goods, uh, including some things that are of strategic importance to the United States and, and to the other Western allies in terms of some strategic uh, metals, uh, neon, and, and, and of course, foodstuffs. So, so long as the war continues, the uh, the Black Sea is is not completely open for commerce, and and you have negative impacts there. So, so those are the main choke points uh, that uh, we. Well, that's plenty, and uh, you know the other thing I would add to this, although it's not like on the Panama Canal, um, it's it's not a problem at the at the moment, but both terminals. Um, on both sides of the Panama Canal are, um, I don't know if you want to call it owned, but basically controlled by China. Yes. So like, like you were saying earlier, they can, if they can, they think they can control the Red Sea, who knows, but soon they could think they control the Panama Canal. The, and again, this is part of what I call projection of power. The, we have military bases around the world. That's part of our projection of power. The Chinese have managed to uh, infiltrate, if you will, a lot of the world ports. And uh, uh, some of those are tied to Belt and Road uh, Initiative loans with the fine print saying that if you default on the loan, we can take over your port. And thank goodness countries are getting wise to the fine print and are increasingly dubious of wanting to accept uh, what appears on the surface to be Chinese largesse, but is, is really in part uh, a, a projection of, of Chinese foreign policy. So it, it's not necessarily a good thing to allow that kind of Chinese foreign investment in your country, you know, where they can end up controlling your, your key resources like, like a port facility. And I talk about that a lot in my China briefing. We, we look at, at the good, the bad, and the ugly uh, that the Chinese do with foreign investment around the world. And some of it actually is positive, but most of it is pretty much self-serving. All right, so I wanna wrap up by talking a little bit about energy supply and prices. This is an area where things are a little bit uh, better looking. Uh, first, oil and gas supplies are abundant globally, uh, particularly here in the United States. As a result, despite the, uh, uh, the wars and other conflict areas, uh, I predict that prices will remain pretty stable. You might see occasional spikes based on bad news, but uh, you know, Goldman Sachs telling us there'll be $300 or $500 a barrel oil in 2024 is just nonsense. And, and they do some kind of scare thing like that virtually every year. If you're involved in the actual physical oil and gas business, you know the fundamentals. The fundamentals are entirely against that. Uh, but there can be temporary disruptions in region to region, and, and there can be temporary spikes in, in prices. But I expect that we'll see it ch channeling pretty much in the 75 to 85, sometimes passing $90 range. Could it go above 100 temporarily? Yeah, but it wouldn't be for long. If we didn't have the war uh, and, and a couple of other little hotspot areas, you, you'd see oil prices falling below uh, $70 a barrel and, and maybe even below 60. That's what the fundamentals tell us. And, and, and gas is even uh, more interesting. Gas is really cheap here in the United States. It's pricey in, in Europe. Uh, because of Russia. Electric power generation will continue to increase, but so will the reliance on coal uh, in, in Asia. And, and there's nothing we can do about it. You know, spending trillions of dollars on stuff supposedly to improve the, the environment means nothing when most of the rest of the world doesn't participate in that. And, and it results in meaningless, meaningless change. Uh, we need a whole better approach to environmental policy than we have today. But one of the positive things, gas is a less polluting uh, way of generating energy and, and gas reliance will increase in the short term. 
On renewables, we continue to, to see growth of renewables around the world. And what's really encouraging to me is that you're going to see alternatives to our current technology that will bring the prices of renewable energy way down. They will not deploy commercially for a few more years yet, but these changes are coming and that is really on, on, on the bright side of, of things. So we, we do have some good things to look forward to in, in that regard. All right, uh, contact information. If you want to know more about any particular thing or, or you have other issues and concerns, feel free to contact me. I'm happy to answer questions. Okay, All right, so yes, uh, anybody has questions, like we'll start with the chat box and I may ask you, have you asked the question? Uh, so you mentioned uh, lithium at the end, and I know that there's been finding uh, in terms of lithium uh, in the U.S. So it seems like we have ample supply. We just don't have like the willpower to to do anything with it at this point. Is that, <laughs> is that the case? Well, it's true of lithium and also strategic metals. The, the, the rare earths are not particularly rare. It's just that we don't have the mining capacity you know, for a variety of reasons, including the not in my backyard kind of thing, environmental issues and so on. But there, there is an abundance of these rare earths uh, and other strategic metals. And unfortunately, some of those are in places that are in conflict areas. The, the Congo, Democratic Republic of Congo, I should say, is rich in those resources, but it's a pretty inhospitable country geographically, environmentally speaking. And so it would take a real effort and, and many, many billions of dollars to be able to, to create a, uh, uh, a mining capacity and a supply capacity to then take that out of country. It, it's a huge country. It, it's basically served by the Congo River, which is a really long river. So it's a long supply chain just to get it to the ocean. Interesting. <laughs> Very good. And then, uh, let's see, well, there's a question here, um, and that maybe I'll have to answer this, but how is it that China can control the Panama Canal? Um, do, you, do you want to answer it, John, or do you want me to? <laughs> so, so it's not like that the, they can just throw the switch or, you know, turn, turn the levers or whatever and, and keep the power off or or cut the water off and so on. They, they don't have that capacity uh, in, in real terms. Could they develop that capacity? Uh, could they then support it by, by bringing troops in and so on? Yeah, of course they could. It's unlikely that they would do that, at least in, in the near term. And as I've said in, in the China briefing, uh, we are at the most dangerous part of China's existence. It is at peak power now and through maybe the next eight or 10 years, and, and then it's going to decline. And so you're in the classic Thucydides trap moment. Does the lesser power realizing it can't succeed the, the dominant power, the United States, strike at its strongest and bring down the dominant power as an equalizer? that's historically been what countries have tried to do with varying degrees of success. You know, but it's a trap that can be avoided. It can be avoided with strong projection of power and its effective use. It can be avoided by diplomacy. We do not have to be at war with China. But right. we have the <laughs> job of making sure that doesn't happen. Correct. Yes, there's... Plenty of economic ways we can do that as well, to your point. Uh, the, Tony has a question on, is, sol is solar powered desalination a solution to water supply? Maybe long term. Uh, short term, it's not cost effective. So uh, desalination plants are costly. Uh, there are very promising technologies that uh, may bring the cost down dramatically. Over time, there's a, and I don't know how to describe it in, in more detail than this, there's a new kind of membrane that is uh, being studied uh, that, that would dramatically reduce the, the cost of, of traditional desalination just by that one replacement. 
that, that one substitution. So I, I think long-term we solve that problem. Uh, we know that, that we need water, fresh water to live. We are blessed in the United States with an abundance of water. Not all of it is where we live, which is why a place like Phoenix doesn't make a whole lot of sense to have that many millions of people, you know, completely right. away from a reliable uh, source of water in, in enough volume to sustain that population. And with, for a variety of reasons, the Colorado River uh, not getting replenished uh, and, and being diverted for so many other purposes, you know, Phoenix is is in jeopardy. Uh, if if yeah. environmental trends continue, it, there will not be enough water for Phoenix. And, yeah, and that's and a problem, um, especially since uh, what I think what's happening is is that because of the um, well, the harsh uh, regulations that are going on in California, more and more companies are moving manufacturing and distribution hubs. To Phoenix, so you know it's it's it is a it is a challenge <laughs> to be sure. We we need the water, you know, not, not only to live, but we need it for a lot of manufacturing processes, and, yeah. and that means that if we have to build expensive desalination plants to be able to to have that water to sustain our population and, and our manufacturing, we will ultimately build them, and yeah. there, there's a whole lot of ocean. Yeah. And and we, we oh, sure to your point, don't. we will, and it'll be inflationary, but it's not necessarily something that, like, I think it's beyond that point for China. Like they're, like my understanding is, is their water supply is so acute. It's crazy. <laughs> and, and they're dealing with a much greater population. I mean, 40% of their uh, arable land is unfarmable today. So even if they had the water, that land is so polluted, they can't use the water on that land for farming. So right. it's it's one of the things that actually in the short term has helped China because you know the water can be used for uh for drinking and for uh manufacturing. But there's no more supply. Right. Uh, absent some serious change in in environmental conditions, they're they're not going to be blessed with with much more abundant rainfall than what they're currently getting. So with polluted rivers uh, you got to clean the water and you, you can only build so many desalination plants. You know, it's one thing for a smaller country to do that and be able to meet the needs. But for, for the many, many hundreds of millions in, in China, that's right. that's not a solution that covers the problem. Right. And they're actually building like a, or they at least permitted for like a one coal plant a week um, in the last year. Which is obviously the opposite of what uh, you know the world is like looking for in terms of uh, pollution control, et cetera. So there's there's a lot of um, challenges. So I know that I think one of the things that you recommend, John, from a supply chain point of view, is to make sure that um, that if that that if you are dependent on on China for your supply chain, that you find alternatives. Um, is that correct? That's correct. You know, it, it just makes sense to diversify out of China you know, by by spreading your your capability to, to more than one country. You're you're reducing your risk, and of course, at somewhat greater cost. But it, it's just the prudent thing to do. You know, we, yeah. we spent a lot of years promoting the most efficient supply chains, and and what we've learned from that is that resilience is also important. Yeah, absolutely. One last question, since I know we're getting uh, close to the end here. But what do you think about India? Because I know that India has become more and more popular from a uh, manufacturing uh, point of view. And so uh, more and more companies are thinking that, that might be a potential solution. So like, uh, what do you think about that? There are a lot of good things going on in India. For one thing, it's a democracy, a very messy democracy, but it's a democracy. But you have a lot of people there as well. It's the most populous country on earth now. And it does not have the resources to provide enough food and water for all of its people. So one of the limitations, again, where manufacturing requires fresh water, yeah. that's the thing that is in short supply in India. 
India turns out more engineers than anywhere else in the world, and they're looking for work. They are self-employed, many of them. Same thing with computer science graduates. You, you have really smart people who are looking for work, looking for, for good work to do because uh, India isn't growing fast enough to assimilate all the people that they're educating. And, and yet, once you get out of the major cities and, and, and a few other areas, you literally like China, you're going back in time to uh, uh, traditional farming methods, agriculture, not a lot of, of economic activity in, in large chunks of the country. So it can do the, the growth, but it can't do it the way that China did, not, the, not entirely the same way. On the other hand, I, I think India can do a better job in some ways. They have to get rid of some of the onerous regulations and restrictions on business. They have to be a lot more open to foreign investment. Their banking system is still pretty much backwards in, in, a, in a lot of ways. So from an infrastructure standpoint, they they have to do those things first in, right. in order to make the next level of, of growth possible. Well, and to some degree, aren't they fighting about, over their the water with China and the border and that type of thing as well? Yeah, it's it's not a shooting war, thank goodness, but the, this is a constant a source of friction between the two countries. You have yeah. several major rivers that originate in the Himalayas, and, and China, unfortunately, has the ability to, to block the flow of a couple of those rivers, if it so chose to do. <laughs> Similar to the Panama Canal. <laughs> All right. Well, very good. Does anybody else have any questions? Um, I don't see any. So that's great, uh, John. Like we could always talk for hours because there's so much to talk about in terms of what's going on in the world. But I like how you set it up with the um, hot spots around the world. And then there's several choke points. I mean, that is the idea is, is that you have you're only as strong as your weakest link in the supply chain. And with all those choke points causing problems at some critical links and junctures in the supply chain, there is definitely, um, from a business standpoint, you need to be thinking ahead. I mean, backups are no longer just a backup. You really need to be diversifying and making sure that you have, um, that you can sustain <laughs> your business and your customers. So um, thank you for going into uh, details and, and sharing with us uh, your expertise. And uh, from that point of view, I'd like to also let folks know that we're going to be having another, well, several more webinars throughout 2024. Uh, so stay tuned to our announcements. And we're also having a member appreciation event. And if you've been involved uh, with the uh, with our chapter and or your supporter like John, you're more than welcome to attend. Uh, it's going to be at uh, Heroes. And check out our recent newsletter and or website uh, to uh, sign up. Uh, you have to sign up in order to attend, but it is free for members and for special guests. So we look forward to seeing you there and uh, we will see you again next month. And thank you very much, John. Appreciate your sharing your expertise with our group. My pleasure. Thank you, Lisa. All right. Thank you. Bye all. Bye.